Thank you for coming. It's a pleasure to it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I have spoken at Ornava before, but I have never been here. And um, uh, whenever we can get together to be Mikadesh Hem Shamayim, uh, it's a reason to celebrate. So, um, you know, when a speaker when a speaker comes somewhere to speak, so you know, the speaker has to think about okay, what's my mindset? What's my mood? Who am I speaking to? Who am I speaking with? And most important, what do I want to accomplish? What do I want you to go home today with? You shouldn't just come and hear a speaker and you know, you hear an idea and then you leave and the question is, was that worth an hour? You could have actually gone to TorahAnytime.com, <laughs> speaking of, and, uh, and you could have heard a shear there. You know, why, why see it in person? So I take that responsibility very seriously and I'm hoping that uh, that you will come away with something very important here tonight. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I live in Muncie, New York. My name is Ben Sion Klatsko. Um, I do Kiruv on a college campus. I've been doing Kiruv now for, uh, for about 12 years. And before that, I was a Rav for 10 years. So, so 22 years in the Rabbanus. I've also been married for 22 years. We have 11 children, Kanai Nahar. And um, uh, our oldest is... Uh, Chassenbacher and the youngest is is three months, so they span span uh, all of childhood. Um, what else can I tell you? Oh, and um, we do we do Shabbatones every week at our home, so I want to invite you in case I don't remember to do it later. If you would ever like to come up to Muncie and join us for a Shabbaton. We do have one weekly, and you're all very much invited. It's funny because a few, a few years ago, we lived in California. We moved four years ago. And besides being the rabbi on the college campus, I was also the rabbi for the Hollywood crowd. And I had a lot of directors and producers and actors who used to come to a special class for the Hollywood crowd. And in Hollywood, when someone wants to invite you, but they're not really inviting you, so they give you something called a Hollywood invite. You know what that looks like? That's like, hey, you're coming? Catch you, right? Like they shoot you. Catch you, right? You come? You know, call me, call me, call me. No one's going to call, no one's going to come, right? But it's all very superficial. So uh, when, I, when I invite you, I really do mean you're invited, you're welcome to come. We had the, this week, we had Emmet, actually. We had, uh, we had 70 students from Emmet come for Shabbat. And... Um, and each week we have another group. Um, uh, we have Baragola this week. That's right. You guys are coming to me? I'm so honored. Okay. One, uh, one last thing I wanted to mention is that among the projects that we do, we're involved in Shidduchim. We're involved in uh, sometimes kids at risk. We, we, we try to sort of find the need, fill a need. So one of the needs that we saw and that became our passion, and I'm just going to share with you quickly, many of you know that I started a website called seeyouonshabbos.com. Anyone heard of it? Raise your hand if you've heard of it. Yes, wonderful. If you haven't heard of See You on Shabbos, um, go to See You on Shabbos or See You on Shabbat.com. You could sign up, you could travel anywhere in the world, and you have a place for Shabbat or Shabbos. And... Uh, <laughs> And also, if you want to be a host and you happen to have a, a home that you feel very, um, is very welcoming and very open, you could sign up to be a host. You could sign up to be a host or a guest. And if you're old enough for Shidduchim, when you sign up for a guest, check off the button that says available for Shidduchim because Shad Khanim are going on the, sites, on, the, on the site looking to see which guests are available. And sometimes over the Shabbos table, L'Shadach HaBanos, it's part of what we do over the Shabbos table. So uh, that's called seeyouonshabbos.com. If you forget it, I have cards I can give you afterwards. Primarily, what I do is I teach, uh, I teach rabbis how to do Kiruv. So there are rabbis who go onto a college campus and they do Kiruv. And my job is to teach them what do you do? What do you say? What happens if the student says they're going to show up at 2 o'clock and then they don't show up at 2. Or what happens if they want to go, you want them to go to Israel, but they have an internship so they can't go. What do you do? How do you 
how do you guide them? When do you tell them it's time to start kosher, Shabbos? And that's, that's what I do. And I travel the country each week. I go to a few different cities and I teach the rabbis how to do it. And part of the result of that job is that I've become very sensitive to trying to find leaders and leadership. I look for who are going to be the next leaders. Who are the next people who will stand in front of the Jewish people and be able to be mashpim, be able to influence. And in this room, there are people. And it's hard to know who, and many of you are very young, but some of you have a fire burning inside of you that is waiting to, waiting to grow large and expand and just burst out into a, into a conflagration, into a, into a bonfire. And my job is to sort of figure out who are those people and then we look and we hire them and we help them uh, actualize their potential. So because of that, I look for leaders. And it led me to think, what, what is a leader? What is a leader? Who's a leader? How do I tell if someone's sitting in front of me if they're a leader? Let me ask you something. By a raise of hands, no one be modest here. Just be yourself. How many people here look at themselves like leaders? How many people here? Is that it? Is that it? No? No, you don't? Well, the truth of the matter is, you all should have had your hands raised. Because, number one, the Jewish people are leaders. We are Mamlachas Khanim, the Goy Kadosh. So we don't have a choice. We have to lead by example. But even more so, do you plan on being parents? Well, guess what? If you're a parent, you're a leader. And even if you don't look at yourself like a leader, you are a leader. Because the, your kids are going to look up to you. They're going to see how to act. You're going to lead the way. What are we doing in How are we going to spend the Shabbos table? Am I going to fall asleep at the Shabbos table? Am I going to kvetch about Pesach clean? Am I, am, am I going to make Purim very festive? Am I going to make Tisha B'Av and Yom Kippur meaningful? We have to lead as parents. So the truth is everyone should have raised their hand. We just don't look at it like that. But what makes a leader a leader? Is it somebody who is opinionated? Well, sometimes you have to have an opinion if you're going to be a leader. Is it someone who's a good listener? Yeah. If you don't know how to listen, you can't lead. There are many answers to this question. I even once saw in a book about leadership that there's never been a really good leader, positive leader, who didn't have a beautiful smile. <laughs> That's right. You got to have it. You can all smile now. <laughs> practice. Practice. You got to have Use the Rembrandt. It's important, right? Okay, you got to have a nice smile because it's one of the things that make people feel welcome. And, and Shlomo, Shlomo HaMalach said, uh, said such, you know, the white of our teeth is what makes us feel welcome. What makes a leader a leader? So I want to speak about one thing tonight that is very near and dear to my heart. I believe that the world is broken up into two kinds of people. And I even believe that this room has those same two kinds of people. I don't know who's who, but there are two kinds of people in the world. And they are givers and takers. And the question is, who are you? Who are we? Now, right away, we may want to say, hey, I'm a, I'm, I'm a giver, I'm not a taker. I want you to Reserve your judgment until the end of the talk. Okay? Who are we? Are we givers or are we takers? Now, the truth of the matter is, everyone gives and everyone takes, right? Do we all give? We all take? That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is, if you strip yourself down to your very essence and to figure out what turns you on, what inspires you, is it the act of giving? Are you inspired by giving? Or does the act of taking turn you on? And at least, at least half the world is inspired by receiving, by taking. Now, when we are born, what are we, givers or takers? takers. We're all takers. Every little kid is a taker. The Gemara even says, it's actually, it's a medrash, that when we are very, very young, little babies, we are like kings. 
You know why? Because when a king wants something, he wants his crown. What does he say? He says, bring me my crown. And everyone jumps up and they bring him the crown. So when a little baby wants a baby bottle, what does he say? <laughs> everyone makes a baby noise, right? <laughs> right? And then everyone jumps up. Oh, he wants his baby. He wants his bottle. He wants a burp. He wants a... Right? We jump up. Little baby gets what he wants. Screams, bring me my bottle. And we bring him. So a little baby is an absolute taker. And that's how God made it. Hashem made that we should, little babies have to carve a little space for themselves on planet earth. There's nothing wrong with a baby being a taker. But then the baby gets a little bit older. Five, six, seven. Is he a giver yet? No. 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 If you've seen a seven-year-old who is a giver, you have seen one in a thousand. They don't really exist. Get a little bit older. Right? We've got to, we've got to move, forward, move forward. Okay? 11, 12, 13, 14. Already, there are certain people, Yechidim, they're individuals who at a very young age have become givers. Very few. If you have a child who at the age of 12 has transitioned from being a taker to a giver, you have the golden child. Because it's really tough. A 12-year-old is selfish. I, me, mine. A little bit older. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Any question after this. Okay. You get a little bit older, and then certain people do begin to transition. And you notice it. You notice it in your friends. You may notice it in yourself, hopefully. Where you begin to enjoy. First, it begins with making a card, a Mother's Day card or a birthday card for mom or dad. Right? Mommy, Tati, Abba, Ima. Oh, I love you so much. And make a little party for them. We begin to understand that we owe them something. The kids transition the age at a certain age. Little kids don't get it. Get a little bit older. And then we begin to like to give, to enjoy giving. And at the age of 18, 19, 20, there is a nice percentage of the population that has transitioned. But most people have not. Most people are still raging takers by the age of 20. And then they get older, 22, 23, 24, 25. And slowly but surely, more people transition. But at least half the world does not transition. They are and will always remain takers. And that's the way it is. And they could be much older. They could be the age of 40, 50, 60. They're the people who you want to park and they won't let you park because they found a way to squish in between you to get into that parking spot because it's their world and you happen to be visiting and that's it. Or they're the people that won't let you merge on the highway because it's their world. They are born takers. Sometimes I'll read in the newspaper where a 70-year-old guy makes a big donation and it says, they said, wow, you just gave a great donation. What came over you? And he says, oh, I felt it was time to give back. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my goodness, you're 70 years old. What happened till now? Right? 70 years old, you haven't, didn't think, uh, think of giving back beforehand? The question is, who are we? I'll tell you a beautiful saying. The saying goes like this. The world is made of givers and takers. The takers eat better, but the givers sleep better. Who, who do you want to be? The person that eats better or the person that sleeps better? So I want to tell you something. If you look in the mirror, if you look in the mirror and you say, you say, I'm, I'm a giver, but you don't remember ever working on being a giver, you're probably not. Because giving is not a natural thing. Hashem made us with an neshama, but Hashem also made us with a nefesh bahamis. We have an animal instinct that wants to gather and wants to protect, and it's mine, and uh, anyone who tries to take mine, I'm going to pounce on. Right? Take, it's, it's a human, it's an angelic thing, it's a godly thing to give. So who are we? The Rambam says if a person has a chance to give a thousand dollars to tzedakah, the Rambam doesn't say dollars, yes, but $1,000 to tzedakah. And he can give it in one shot or he can give it one dollar at a time. What is better to do? One at a time or to give the whole thing in one shot? One at a time. One at a time. You know why? Because you give it in one shot, you're a martyr. 
Oh, okay, you know, yeah, that one moment of inspiration. Yeah, the flash. Oh, I gave it. Did you, did you ever give? Did you, did you ever give? more stucker than you intended to. A guy comes over to you or a girl comes over to you and you know, you figure, give him a dollar, you take out your, your pocketbook or your wallet and you pull out a $20 bill and you think, or, you know, what the heck. And you give it to the honey and then the rest of the day, you're thinking, oh, I could have spent it on the food. You know, I don't want to think like that. I, don't, I, don't, I want to get the credit for giving it but still, I could have given 10 and it would have been enough, right? And you have this inner, yeah, okay, I see some people can relate. Yeah, there's inner battle because it's really, really tough. It's very tough to give. It's, it's, a, it's a genuine tough thing. And that's why the Rambam says it is better to give $1 at a time. Because if you do, you practice your giving muscle. You know what the giving muscle looks like? It looks like this, in and out. That's how it goes, in. It's a giving exercise. It's like heavy, heavyweight lifting. Oh, oh. Because it's, it's not too heavy, but a wallet and taking dollars out of it is very heavy. Anyone here ever been to the, to the co-cell? Yeah. Right? And you're trying to dive in and someone comes over to you, stucka, stucka. So, hey, okay, you're American, rich, rich American. So you give him a dollar. And then he begins to dive in. I gave my stucka. A moment later, stucka, stucka. Oh, wow, two, another guy. Okay, give him a dollar. You're down here, stuck and stuck. And after guy number 17, you're like, okay, you know what? This is ridiculous. I can't dive it. I don't know how it is by the women, but by the men, it could genuinely get frustrating. <laughs> you know, it's by, by, by the women as well. It's, it's genuinely frustrating. And you, and you don't want to give, and you have to battle, and you have to fight. It's tough to give. And that's the reality of life. It's very tough to give. So, I'll tell you something personal. Um, I married a, a lady named Shani Juravel. Anyone ever hear of Rabbi Juravel tapes, books, no one? Oh, you heard of him? That's my father-in-law. He's a, he's a, he makes these tapes for kids. And my wife is a tzaddikist. She's a, I'm, there's on Torah anytime. Hi, everyone. Right? She's a very, a very big tzaddikist. For 22 years, I wake up every morning and there's a hot cup of coffee waiting by my bed. For 20, she gets up before me so she can bring me coffee. I never asked her to. 22 years. And if I drink and fall back asleep, there's a second cup. <laughs> and if I don't drink it and it gets cold, she heats it up. So I married a giver. And when you marry a giver, life is tough. Because if you're not a giver, and I'm not a natural giver. I find giving tough. I'll be honest. I, I really do. I'll tell you, one of the things that, that we do uh, that... I, I do is I collect art. It's like a little hobby of mine, sort of getting out of the hobby, sort of, but I still have a lot of art. One of the things that I used to collect was something called Holocaust art. Now, if you ever hear of Holocaust, heard of Holocaust art, you think to yourself, wow, that is so morbid. Why would anyone collect Holocaust? Well, like, what is Holocaust art? So there's a big machlokus what Holocaust art is. Is it art that's painted now, but of a Holocaust scene? Or is it just a scenery, but it was painted during the Holocaust? Or, like, exactly what it, what it, you know, what is Holocaust art? But if you have a real Holocaust piece, for example, a piece that's dated 1942, that was painted in the camps, and the painting is of the people in the camps, Right, that's a, that's a very frightening piece to look at. Right? That, that's, that's the saddest part of our history. So when I first heard people collect Holocaust art, I think, wow, that's nuts. But slowly but surely, I began to understand. And I collected, uh, you know, I ended up collecting some Holocaust art uh, myself. I just, it was meaningful to me. It once happened that at an auction, I bought a book. That the whole book was painted and drawn in the Holocaust. And the subject were Holocaust subjects and every single page was dated. So like the artist drew a picture of a rabbi, named the rabbi in the bottom and said when he died. And it was painted in the camps. So that's like a crazy piece of Holocaust art. And not only that, but on the back cover of the book, the artist somehow after the war must have gotten a, an original copy of Hitler's stationery. That's right, Hitler also says, Mein Geführ, right? Hitler stationary, Mein you know, and, and she wrote on, she glued it to the back page, and she wrote on it in Hebrew, and yet we, and yet we overcame. It's a very emotional piece of, uh, piece of uh, art. What a collectible. So I, I said, that's it, I have to own this. And I, I bought it, and I got a very good price on it, much less than, than it really was worth. 
But like I mentioned to you, got the 11 kids, which means lots of tuitions. And when I heard of somebody who collects art, Holocaust art, I said, you know what, maybe, um, maybe I'll offer it to them and maybe they'll want to buy it. I'll help, <laughs> it'll help me pay for tuitions this year. So I, uh, I went to this person, it was a lady, and I said, you know what, I've got this piece of Holocaust art, would you like to see it? So she said, sure, I'd love to see it. I take out the book, she looks at it, she begins to flip the pages, and then she says, what do you want for it? <laughs> Just like that. So I wasn't prepared for that, I thought I'll have a little negotiation back and forth. So I said, I want 25000 wow. <laughs> So the lady immediately takes out her checkbook and just writes it out. Oh my God. So I, I felt very bad, right? I, I could have asked for 50 you know. <laughs> well, you know, tafasta, maruba, lo tafasta. Anyways, so we got 25000 uh, you know, I paid a fraction of that. So I'm, I'm on my way home with this. going to pay tuitions for at least half the kids. Like, really exciting. So, what? And the Shach <laughs> so I So I called my wife on the way home, and I said, guess what? We got, we got this amazing check. And, uh, we weren't used to getting checks like this. Like for, so her first words to me were, great, before you even get home, I want to write out the Meiser check. Because I want to make sure it's in the mail. We shouldn't get lazy. We shouldn't get, right? Let's just, she says, who do you want to make it out to? And here I am. I'm just relishing 25 grand in my hand. Already 25. Now, of course, you got to get miser, But the idea of right away on the spot, and I'll be honest with you, I'm thinking in my mind, wow, that's, that's a lot. I, you know, I'm not usually the kind of guy that writes out a $2,500 uh, check to Staka, $36, 18 you know. To 2500 and I'm thinking, wow, whoever would be happy with 2500 probably happy with 1000 also, no? And like my, I felt my stomach twisting. And I, and I think, you know, giving is tough. It's genuinely tough to be a giver. And that's the first thing we have to appreciate. Giving is difficult. And if we want to become givers, we have to start and think, about, have to think okay, how do we give? How does one give? Um, yeah, okay, there are had Tehrim, but, you know, so, now let's say a person does not have money, you know, a lot of you are students, I imagine you don't have money, right, you don't have a lot of money to spend, it's good to still give tzedakah, but there are so many other ways that you can become a giver, for example, what, what else can you give besides money? Time, time. right, you, you can give time, you know, I want to tell you, there's a great saying, the saying goes like this, when we are young, we spend all of our time trying to make money. And when we're older, we start spending all of our money to get a little more time. So if we'd be a little smarter, instead of using up all of our youth trying to make money, we would stop and smell the roses and, and play with the kids and spend time with our spouse. And instead, you know, we, we, we work to get that money, then we get a little bit older and we need, we need the time. We understand the time is much more precious. And people don't want to give up time. There's a, there's a very famous story of this little kid who turns to his father and the father was a lawyer and the father never had any time to spend with him. So the kid one day turns to the father and says, Dad, you're a lawyer, how much do you make? And the, and the father says, I don't want to tell you, I don't tell my children how much money I make. No, really, Dad, how much money do you make? You're a lawyer. I don't really tell my, really, Dad, and he's nudging and nudging. Finally, his father says, okay, you know what, I, I make 150 an hour. So the son runs out of the room, runs to his, runs to his bedroom, comes back with his piggy bank, breaks it open, the money goes all over the dining room table, and he says, here, Daddy, how much, how much time will this buy me with you? I want to spend some time with you. How much time will this buy? Because time is tough. And I want to tell you, they did a study, and the number one thing that men in America feel guilty about is not, not fidelity with their marriage. They should. But you know, you know the number one thing they feel guilty about? Not spending enough time with their children. It's the number one thing that men in America feel guilty about as well as they should feel guilty about it. Right? So time is something that you can give. You can give someone time. You've given them a very valuable gift. What else can you give? 
Yeah. Friendship. You can give friendship. Real friendship. Be there. Be there when things are tough. Right? Be there for them. What else? Advice. You can give advice. Right? Everyone has an area of expertise. So be there. I want to tell you, we were involved in the Shaduchim, and there was a, a, um, a girl, and I was looking at her for possible Shidduch, and I checked her out, and what we heard about her is she's always very well prepared for her tests. She's always studying, she's always well prepared, and then the day of the test, her friends will come over to her, oh, I, I didn't study quickly, can you tell me, can I read your notes, can I... And she'll sit down with them, and she'll go through all of her notes. And then when she's finished, another girl will go over to her and say, you know what, I didn't study. And she'll very patiently start all over and go through all the notes again and again. So I said, wow, that's the kind of girl that I want to be my sister-in-law. And, that's, and, uh, and I uh, introduced her to my brother-in-law. Because she was willing to give of her advice and her time. What else can we give? Smile. You give your smile. It's the easiest thing. There's no one who has an excuse not to practice their smile in the mirror. <laughs> you must. There was a there's a very there's a very great a very great a very great rav, right? He was called the altar of Navardic, right? And he used to stand in front of the mirror and once his Talmudim came in, uh, and oh, actually there's Rucham Shmulevitz as well. And, and the Talmudim came in and they said, what are you doing? Are you standing in front of the mirror? <laughs> Smiling. He says, my face is a Risha Sarabim. People, they pass by my face. It's like a, it's like a pit in the, in the public property. If I show an angry face, right, and someone say, good morning to you. No, it's not good morning. <laughs> uh, right? it, it's a, it's a, it's a buzzkill. It's terrible. So we have to be people who share our smiles. So you can, that's a very good example. What about love? Is love a form of giving? And we all know that the word ava comes from the word hav, which means give. So they're the very same thing. So there are so, so many ways, there are really thousands of ways that you can give if you just open up your eyes. I want to tell you, I was in, Aust- I was in South Africa and I was staying by these people and they had three daughters. And the oldest daughter... Nice girl, but very not helpful, not, not really friendly, really living for herself. Like, these are little kids, like 12, 10, and 8. So the 10-year-old was the opposite. The 10-year-old was one of those rare kids. As soon as I came in, can I take your coat? Can I get you a drink? Can I do this? And she's helping her mommy. And, she's... and the difference between the 12-year-old and the 10-year-old was startling. But I didn't say anything. I'm a guest at their house. But the mother of these kids must have noticed that I was noticing the great difference. So she said to me, listen, I know you're noticing the difference. I want to tell you, my oldest daughter, she's not a bad girl. She's a great girl. But let me explain to you the difference between the oldest and the second one. The oldest daughter is trying to get from point A to point B. And she's not sure if she's going to succeed. So she narrows her vision and she just aims whatever that point B is, whether it's getting her her dress or getting to her room or getting to her practice or getting her free time, whatever it is, she just narrows her vision. She cannot incorporate anyone else in her vision. But the 10-year-old has this confidence that things are going to be okay. So she widens her vision. And by widening her vision... She is able to include everyone else along for the ride. And that's the wide vision. So I was so struck by that idea that I, when I got back from South Africa, I, I said, we're having a family conference. We do a lot of these family conferences. And I, you know, we have a big family, a family conference. So family conference, and all the kids sat around the couch. And I said, Kindelach, children, I want to teach you about something called wide vision because we have to learn how to all have wide vision we have to have confidence that we're going to get from point A to point B and we have to have confidence to bring the rest of the world along with us for the ride and it's just you know it's, it's not technical it's more of an image if you could picture the image of wide vision then you'll understand what I'm talking about I want to tell you a story of giving there was this fellow and he was driving home from work one day and he hears on the radio 
a concept called breakfast for supper. Now, what is that? Breakfast for supper is what they have in Europe and Israel. You see, in America, we have the big meal last, last. last for supper. In Europe and in Israel, they have the big meal for lunch. So in Israel, they have breakfast for supper. They have little lachmaniot or lepin, little gvinat uva, whatever it is. But it's something very light. And that's it. then they go to sleep. But in America, we come home and we're ready for supper and we eat meatloaf and mashed potatoes and spaghetti and hot dogs and hamburgers and steak and our stomachs bust and burst and we're all sick and that's who we are in America. And you know, then we sit down on the couch with the remote or with the book or whatever, or with our computer and we're just, you know, we're not ourselves. So this person on the radio was saying, if Americans would start doing breakfast for supper, we would feel much healthier. So the guys, you know what? I'm going to try that. And he comes home, and he tells his wife this concept, breakfast for supper, and says, can we do this? She says, sure, what would you like? He says, well, did you make supper yet? No, not yet. How about oatmeal? <laughs> so she says, that's all you want is oatmeal? 100%, all, all you need is oatmeal? All we need is oatmeal, and that's enough for supper. So she says, great, that's very easy to prepare. She filled up the pot with water, boiled it up, Poured in the flakes, mixed it around, voila, she's got supper already. A few minutes later, little 11 year old Lisa comes walking the door. Hi, Mom, what's for supper? Oh, tonight we're having oatmeal. <laughs> she says, Oatmeal for supper? Ma, I hate oatmeal. So just then the father walks in, and the father says, No, we're all eating oatmeal together as a family. See, it's what fathers do. We put the words as a family at the end of any sentence and it legitimizes it. We're going to eat. Yeah, you know, you know what your, parents, your fathers do. We're eating oatmeal as a family. How do you eat oatmeal as a family? Well, you do. Right? <laughs> You're gonna eat oatmeal as a family. Okay, good. So she's like, she's really distressed, the little Lisa. Everyone sits down. The mother takes the, the ladle and she ladles out into each person's bowl a big dollop of sticky oatmeal and plop it goes in each person's bowl and Lisa's looking on her whore like oh no I am not touching this stuff absolutely not so the father and the mother they begin to eat and Lisa's sitting there and she's got her arms crossed she's not going to touch it after about five minutes the father's finished with his bowl the mother is and Lisa's still sitting there with her arms crossed so the mother says to Lisa, Lisa, why don't you just try it you know you could put butter in it you could put brown sugar it'll taste really good try it she says, Ma, I hate oatmeal. I've tried it before. Why can't we be normal like everyone else and have chicken and rice or something? Who has oatmeal for supper? So then the father's getting a little annoyed. He's at the table as well. He says, Lisa, we're having oatmeal. If you don't want it, you don't have to eat supper. Thank you very much. Dear, can I have another bowl? <laughs> so 10 more minutes pass, and the father finishes his third bowl of oatmeal, which probably kills the whole idea. But... <laughs> Meanwhile, Lisa, she's still sitting there and she is not going to touch the oatmeal. So now the mother is a, is a little bit annoyed, but this time she's annoyed at the father because, like, you know, it's not, it's, it's not Lisa's fault that she doesn't like oatmeal. You know, she's 11 years old. Why should she not be able to, uh, to have supper tonight? So the mother says to uh, the mother, the mother gives a little kick to the father under the table and says, do something for Lisa, you know. I don't, want, I don't want Lisa to starve tonight. So the father says, okay, I have an idea. He leans over, he says to Lisa, Lisa, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. If you eat the oatmeal, I will allow you to ask for something. I'll let you make a request. And Lisa's a normal girl, she's a healthy girl. She's not going to ask for a car or a pony. She'll ask, what a computer game, whatever she asks for, he'll give her, there'll be shalom in the house, and that's it. So Lisa says, okay, I'll do it. And she sticks her spoon into the bowl and she shovels a spoonful of oatmeal into her mouth and makes the requisite awful face. And the father says, come on, it's not that bad. Yes, it is, but I'm still going to eat it. And she, she eats it quickly, quickly, quickly. She finishes the whole bowl, turns it over to prove that there's nothing left. She says, dad, I'm done. And he says, was it really so bad, right? Honestly? Yes, honestly, it was. <laughs> but now, but now, can I, I could ask for something, right? He says, yes, I, I always keep my word. Lisa, what would you like? Okay. I would like, I would like you 
to shave off all my hair. <laughs> so now you have to know that Lisa's cute little girl, long curly blonde hair, and she's like a sweetie. But I want you to shave off all my hair. So the mother's eyes bug out. Like, no, you are not shaving off my daughter's hair. Can I have a word with you in the living room? She says, that's her husband. So the father walks into the living room. Uh Uh-oh, he's still in trouble. So she she says to him in a loud whisper, how could you offer anything? You can't just say you can make any request. What if she would have said, I want to go to Poland? You know, you you can't just say, you can't just say, you know, anything, right? You are not going to shave off my daughter's hair, right? You're not going to do it. Go in there and make it better. The husband says, okay, you know, I have an idea. I know what to do. Don't worry about it. I got it covered. They go back into the kitchen. They sit down. The mother sits down. The father sits down. He leans over to Lisa and says, okay, Lisa, I have an idea. How about a bike? (laughs) And Lisa says, oh, so you're going back on your word, right? You said I could have whatever I want. And now... You're saying, I can't. You're not going to let me shave off my hair. She says, no, 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 no. No, I'm not saying that at all. I I could shave off your hair. I just figured if I shave off your hair after, you know, in a week or two, it's going to start growing back. If I get you a bike, you got yourself a good sturdy bike, don't you? Right? Isn't that what you want? So Lisa says, Dad, I, I know that hair grows back. I want you to shave off my hair. That's what I want. So the father decides to call her bluff and says, okay, let's go upstairs right now and shave off all your hair. So Lisa runs upstairs and the father and mother are now sitting, staring at each other in the kitchen. Like, what's our next move? <laughs> like, they were not expecting it. They thought, he, okay, she's probably trying to teach them a lesson. But she runs upstairs. So the father says, listen, she's always brushing her hair. She's always braiding. She will not let me shave off her hair. Trust me, it's not, don't worry about it. And he begins to walk up the stairs. The mother issues her warning, you better, she better not come down with her hair shaved off, right? I'll let the couch for you, you know? (laughs) So he goes upstairs and he's looking, he's looking for Lisa. He goes into her bedroom, she's not there. Finally, he finds her in the bathroom, sitting on a chair with his clippers plugged into the wall socket the little apron is all on her and she is ready, willing and able to have all of her hair shaved off so now like, this is like this is happening very quickly the father's not sure what to do so he picks, up the, he picks up the clippers puts it by her ear to scare takes a few strands of her hair clicks them off and dangles them in front of her okay, here we go we have started the shaving of the Lisa's head. You see, I'm really going to do this. And dangles these few, few strands of hair. So Lisa says, Dad, quit fooling around. You said you'd shave off all my hair. Shave it off. <laughs> He's holding the clippers. He did promise her. She did eat that bowl of oatmeal. Okay, I guess it's the couch. So he takes, <laughs> he takes the clippers... And from, from the nape of her neck all the way till her eyebrows, he, he shaves a big swatch of, of hair off. Big clumps of hair goes cascading onto the floor like a lawnmower. <laughs> and he's just shaving off her hair. His very cute girl suddenly became very bald. <laughs> And she's looking in the mirror and she's all delighted and she's all excited. And finally he finishes all her hair and he says, okay, Lisa, this is how you like it? So Lisa puts her hand on her scalp. She says, dad, I love it, but I still feel like prickers. Can you get rid of the prickers? (laughs) He says, Lisa, you're killing me. Okay, listen, once we'll do it, let's do it all the way. And he takes out his electric shaver that he uses for his face and on on her head, He finished, her skull looked like an egg, you know. She comes running down the stairs. She says, Ma, look at me, Dad did it, he did it. And the mother begins to scream, is yelling, and the father's getting yelled at, just utter chaos and pandemonium in the house that night. All right, the next day, morning time, father's eating his breakfast, Lisa comes walking down, and he looks at his daughter and his Stomach sinks and looks, and he says, oh, what happens? Like a nightmare. And then 
he, he begins to think to himself, you know, she's going to get on the bus and they're going to torture her. I mean, they're going to trip her. She's not even going to make it down the aisle. You know, the kids are going to have a field day with her. So, so he says to Lisa, Lisa, you know what? Maybe, maybe I'll drive you to school instead of the bus. Let me drive you. Lisa says, okay, sure, no problem. You know, I'd, I'd rather get driven. I'd rather not wait for the bus. Great. So he, she gets in the car. They drive 10 blocks to the school. And she opens the car door right in front of the schoolyard. And the father whirls around and hands her a baseball cap and says, here, let me put that on. That'll, that'll look really good. <laughs> Excellent. Perfect. Lisa, no, it's okay, Dad. I, I like it just like this. Thank you. I love you. Bye-bye. And she leaves the car, slams the door, and begins to skip towards the school building. And the father sees as from the window of the car as the other kids are staring at his little Lisa. And he's looking at his Lisa with the bald head and the yellow dress blowing in the wind. And he's thinking, Oi, how did breakfast for supper turn into this? And he's so upset at himself. He's about to drive away. And he looks in the rearview mirror and a car pulls up, a mother driving her kid to school. And the driver's side, the driver door opens up and another little girl jumps out. And she too has all of her hair shaved off. And she comes running over to Lisa and they happily hug and they begin to skip towards the school building. And now the father's thinking to himself, this is nuts. What a kind of a trend for little kids. It's like, it's like a little skinheads or something. You know, all the kids, are, everyone shave off your hair. So, and he's about to leave. He's about to leave when the lady who was driving the other girl gets out of her car, walks over to his car. He rolls down the window and she bends over and she says, can I ask you something, sir? He says, sure, what is it? He says, I just want to know, was that your daughter who left the car? He said, yes, that was my daughter. That was your daughter, right? He says, yes, yes, that, that was my daughter. So I want to tell you something about your daughter. Your daughter, your daughter is an angel of God. I hope you know that. He said, pardon me? He said, well, well, maybe you don't know this, but let me explain something to you. My daughter is in your daughter's class. And a few months ago, my daughter was diagnosed with cancer. And she had chemo and radiation and her hair fell out. And she kept going back to school. But a little 11 year olds can be so cruel. They don't understand you know, how sensitive people are. And, and she was so sick and she'd come and they would taunt her and make fun of her. And it was, so, it was so difficult, it was so tough. And about a month ago, my daughter comes home and she says, Ma, I can't do it anymore. And I look at my daughter and she's so sick and she's feeling so bad and now she's being made fun of by her friends. And I looked into her eyes and I said, you know what? You don't have to go back to school. And my daughter for the past month has not only not gone to school, she doesn't even leave her bedroom. She just stays there. And she doesn't even get dressed. She stays in her pajamas and she cries at how ugly is she is and how, how sick she is and how she wishes she was dead. And she screams and she yells. And me as her mother, I'm, I'm downstairs and my heart is breaking into a million pieces. What can I do? And all of that was until last night. Because last night, my daughter got a phone call from your daughter. And your daughter gets on the phone. And your daughter says, you know what? We really miss you back in school. The, the, the kids, they feel so bad at, at how they treated you. Please come back. We really, really miss you. Hey, and don't worry about not having any hair. I don't have any hair anymore either. We could be like twins. Right? Please, why don't you come back to school? And this morning, my daughter came downstairs fully dressed for the first time in a month. And she says, Ma, I want to go back to school. I want to try it again. And I saw life in my daughter's eyes for the first time in a long time. Your daughter may have saved my daughter's life. Your daughter is an angel of God. There are so many ways that we can give. We have to stop and think and be sensitive and have broad vision. I want to share with you something personal. And I shared this with the group who was by me for Shabbos. A few years ago, I got a phone call. 
And it was one of the, those phone calls that eventually we, we, we all get, but when we get it, it's, we don't really know. We're not expecting it. We're not prepared for it. We don't know how to react. My phone call happened on a Motzei Shabbos. And my sister, it was my sister who called up. She's a year older than me. And then there were three boys in a row after, after my sister. A boy, then th a girl, then three boys. And we were three boys in three years, very close, very tight. We grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. They used to call us the three musketeers. We would just have a lot of trouble together and go around together, really tight. My oldest sister, she gets on the phone and she's screaming and she's yelling. And I said, calm down, Devorah. I can't understand what you're saying. You're scaring me. What's the matter? She says, something happened to Gav. Something happened to Gavriel. Gavriel is brother number three. Three and three years, I'm the first. And then came Raphael, then came Gavriel. She said, something happened to him. I said, what happened to him? She said, something happened, something terrible. He had a heart attack. I said, heart attack? He's 28 years old. How do you have a... I, I said, are you sure? Are you... How do you know? I don't... That can't be right. It doesn't make sense. He's healthy. He's complete. How could it be? I said, how is he? Where is he? Is he in the hospital? She said, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I think he's dead. So I felt all the oxygen just being pulled out of me. I, I just said, okay, I have to call you back. I put the phone down, took a moment to compose myself, and called brother number two, Raphael. And he picks up the phone, doesn't say hello, doesn't say anything. He is just weeping and screaming, real loud, anguished screams. So I didn't even ask him. I knew at that point that I had lost... Uh, that I had lost a brother. Hang up the phone, made a plane ticket, and the next day, the Levi was in Eretz Israel. He was living in South Africa at the time. He was there for two years. He had started a shul there. He was a makar of hundreds of people, hundreds upon hundreds. And then he was Nifter, age of 28. We get to the Levi. Normally you come to a Levi and you've got, you know, 100 people, 200 people, how many people, he wasn't even living in Eretz Israel. How many people are going to be at the Leviah? Come to the Leviah, and there are well over a thousand people there. And that's the first indication that I got that something was strange, something was up. And then, throughout the Shiva, great, great tzaddikim came to show their respects. I couldn't believe it. The closed Begarebbe, the V Kozmagrev from Kiryat Sans drove up two and a half hours to pay his respects for my brother. My, my brother was not a, you know, he was a young Gishmaka guy. Ramosha Sternbach came. Like all the big, the big guns, they came out to pay their respects. And that's the first that we got to notice, that we got, that, that, that we got an inkling of the fact that Gavriel was one of the great givers of our generation. One of the really great givers. Today, there are books written about him. There are gatherings that take place in at least three countries every year in his memory. Hundreds of kids are named after him. And the shocking thing is that we didn't know about any of this. The whole thing, the whole thing, he did it quietly and secretly. Never once telling everyone what he was doing with his life. And it all came pouring out after he was nifter. And I want to a little more time, I want to share with you some of those stories, okay? They said at the Leviah that you never said in front of Gavriel, hey, I like your tie. Because if you said to him, I like your tie, the very first and only thing he would do is take it off and give it to you, and that was it. That's how we learned that. You like it? It's yours. During the Shiva, there were three guys who were, who were sitting there, they were paying their respects, and I said to them, let me ask you, being Menachem Avel, was it true you said in front of Gabriel, I could tie and give it to you? One of them said, yeah, completely. One of them said, I'm wearing his shoes, actually. <laughs> I said, you're wearing Gabriel's shoes? Because, yeah, I, was, I said to him, I, he had these new shoes, the nice shoes. He said, hey, they're very comfortable, try them on. Big mistake. I tried them on. I, he said, how do they feel? They feel great. They're yours. The second guy said, I'm wearing his belt. He had a beautiful belt. And the third guy was wearing his cufflings. Each one of them had made a mistake of saying, I like your, and that's how Gabriel taught himself to give. You like it? You have it? It's yours. 
this amazing, you know, I was running a birthright, and I told this story at the birthright Friday night, and then I was saying, Gachavas, Shabbat Shalom, these kids completely secular, and there was this one kid who had a very nice shirt on, it's a blue shirt, I said, oh, Shabbat Shalom, beautiful shirt on, he takes it off, and he gives it to me, and walks around the rest of Shabbos in his undershirt. <laughs> You know, Baruch Omar Vos, all right? He hears about it, he's got to do it. Was it your size? What? Was it your size? No, but I still have it and I cherish it. <laughs> I want to tell you, giving is hardest when you give to your own family. You know, that's why it says, Hine matova manoim sheves achim gam yachad. My grandfather, Zacharin Levracha, used to say, what does that mean? How great it is when brothers sit together. Of course brothers do their brothers. He said, no, no, no. Brothers are the ones who have a tough time. Right? It's, not, it's easy to be, to be nice to a stranger, but your own family, there are certain people who, to their own family, they don't give their wife, they don't give their husband or, or their kids the time of day, but to the rest of the community, they're Mr. and Mrs. Chesed. So the first thing I want to tell you is that his method of chesed began at home. You know, he opened this shul in South Africa. It was called the Sunny Road Synagogue. It was a wonderful shul. It was a Kiru shul. 300 young singles would come each week. They were madly in love with their, with their rabbi. They called him Rav Gav. And they loved Rav Gav. He was their youthful 26-year-old rabbi. Very charismatic, very dynamic. You should know after he passed away, the, the, the youth, these singles of the shul, were so depressed, they sat on his front lawn for seven days. They lit candles in a candlelight vigil because they were so distraught. How could their rabbi just be taken from them? Each week, he would get up and speak. And his wife told me that never once in all the years that he was the rabbi, never once did he forget to mention her in his speech. Every single speech he would say, and my wife, Yocheved, who is sitting here with us today, who is my guide in life, who teaches me everything that is good and true, taught me this beautiful idea today, and, and I want to share it with everyone here. And she would sit there, basking and glowing in the honor that her husband was public, publicly showing her, acknowledging the fact that his community was her community, and his avoda was her avoda as well. And that, and that, my friends, is also giving. He used to suffer from migraine headaches. I don't know if you get migraines, but they're awful. He, God, God used to get cluster migraines, which are the worst kind of pain. They say cluster migraines are worse than labor. It's like multiple migraines at the same time. And in shul, sometimes he'd get it. He'd be all jolly and davening and geschmack, and then all of a sudden his face would turn white. And people would look at him and they would say, oh, He's having his migraine, and he would quietly just leave the shul. He'd go downstairs. He'd lie down on a, on a, on a table in the darkness with no noise and no light because the, the slightest bit of noise was excruciating pain. One evening, he came home after a whole day of counseling his students, and his wife, his wife took one look at him and saw that he was just smitten by a cluster migraine. But she said, you know, I felt a little selfish. I didn't, I didn't have much chance to spend with him today. He spent time with a lot of people. I wanted to spend time with my husband. So I pretended that I didn't notice he had a migraine. And I just began to schmooze with him. Well, guess what? He sat down for 45 minutes and just schmoozed with me with a cluster migraine because he saw that I needed the time. That was more important. There are many stories that hours are hours late. So I'm going to just pick the ones that I think will resonate with you the most. There was this guy who came into the shiva, and I said, how did you know God? He said, oh, he changed my life. Okay, I heard a lot of that. You got to give me a story. He says, okay, well, I'll tell you what happened. I was on an egghead bus in Yerushalayim, minding my own business, when this young man comes on the bus, very jolly and very outgoing, and the empty seat was next to me, so he sits down next to me, and he says, oh, shalom aleichem. And I look at him, oh, wow, he's very friendly. <laughs> Must be an out-of-towner, you know. <laughs> wow, yeah. So he began to schmooze with me. And after two, three minutes, he says to me, you know what? You're very eloquent. You've got a great presence. I have one question to ask you. What are you doing for the Jewish people? And I look at him and I was like, pardon me? What, what do you mean? 
He said, you know, you, a guy like you, we need guys like you. What are you doing for the Jewish people? And I said, I don't know. I never thought about it. Guys, oh, we need you. We really need you. Oh, it's my stop. Got to get off. Take care. And, and he leaves. And that was the last I ever saw of him. But the next day, I'm thinking the whole night, you know what? What am I doing with the Jewish people? Maybe I could be, I should be. And the next day, I signed up to be a lecturer for Arachim. And today I'm one of their chief lecturers. All because Archim is an educational program, a wonderful program. And all because of this five minute encounter with this idealistic shining light that just popped out of us and popped out and just inspired us. There was this fellow who comes into the Shiva and he's very, very overweight. You're talking about 400 pounds plus. And he's sitting on these two chairs and, he's, and I'm speaking to him. And I said to him, okay, tell me what is the deal with you? He says, well, your brother saved my life. Okay, what happened? He says, well, you know what happened? I got married. I got engaged. Now, that's not so easy for me because, you know, I'm obviously beyond the norm. And, uh, and I thought, that, wow, that's really tough. But I got engaged and your brother threw me my engagement party. Can you imagine my embarrassment, my shame? A week later, the girl calls me up and says, I can't go through with it. I can't, I can't get married. I just can't do it. Now, not only do I have a broken engagement, but I may have, I may have lost the last girl who would marry a guy like me. I fell into a deep depression. God heard about it and he began to stop at my house every single night. He would sit there sometimes for hours encouraging me, telling me you're a good guy, you have so much to offer, it's, you're amazing and really boosting my self-esteem and you know what he said to me? He said, you know, you know the problem is I didn't make you a nice enough engagement party. I should have made you a better engagement party. I'm going to make you your second one also. It's going to be much better. It'll, don't worry about it. And he kept me going until I found the woman that I am privileged to call my wife today. And he threw me a much bigger engagement party to celebrate. He said, without him, I don't know where I would be. Story after story after story like this. Just a few more. This husband and wife, they come in to the ship and the wife falls on the ground and she's crying and screaming. I said to the husband, okay, tell me What's going on? Why, why, you know, what was your connection? Because, oh, your brother saved our lives. I said, okay, good. How? He said, well, I was engaged to a non-Jewish girl. And he, I knew your brother wasn't happy. He's a rabbi, but, you know, I did what I thought I wanted to do. One day, your brother calls me and says, you know what? Why don't you come to me Friday night? So I said, okay, I'll come Friday night. I knew at his house, got 30, 40 people. It's Kashmak, it's Labyrinth. I'll have a good time. I, I love Shabbat. I come to his house Friday night, and I'm the only guest. Look at him, where is everybody? He goes, oh, you're the only guest. So I sit down, and for the first time, I'm looking around, and I see the Shabbat, and I see the table, and I see the china, and I see the, the candles, and I see the kids dressed in their Shabbos best, and I see God as he's giving each one a blessing, kissing them on their cheeks, and as he dances around the room with them when they sing Shalom Aleichem, and he puts them on, on his lap after Kiddush, after a magnificent Kiddush, and asks them questions on the Parsha, and I'm just looking, and finally, I blurt out to him, I said, wow, this is exactly exactly what I want. And he looks at me with an uncharacteristically serious face and says, but you're never going to have it. <laughs> Not if you marry this girl. And that's when I knew I had to break it off. And right away after Shabbos, I broke it off. Meanwhile, I now needed a shidduch. He knew of this wonderful girl. He was our shadchan. And then I said to him, you know, since I became religious, then he became more religious and his parents were not happy. So they refused to pay for the wedding. So Gavriel paid for their entire wedding. Wow. Not only did he pay for the wedding, but he was the rabbi who officiated, and he was the drummer at the wedding. He was also a drummer, and he had his own band. So he went straight from here to, to the band. He, as soon as, and when the wedding was over, and it was an amazing wedding, he says, I went over to your brother. I was so embarrassed, but I didn't know who else to turn to. And I said, you know what? I don't even know where to go, where to turn, but... I don't have money for a hotel or a car. Is it possible to borrow $100? I'll pay you back. I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to even ask you. Because what are you embarrassed? I didn't give you your wedding present yet. And he had an envelope all prepared with $1,000. And he gave it to him. This is your wedding present. That uh, amazing ability to give. You should know Hashem knows who to give to. Gavriel, the, a year before he passed away, won the lottery. Wow. And that was a very nice thing because it was able to support his family after he was Nifter. He won the big lottery. 
But he took it and divided it between his siblings and he gave it to the miser. He's told me the only things that he did with the, with the money on his own is he bought, uh, he bought himself a used Toyota and a killer drum set. <laughs> and that's what he did. Because he had this, this knack for giving. Someone went to his garage. They saw these boxes of dishes piled high to the ceiling, deep, maybe 50 boxes of identical dishes. So they joked to them. They said, what was going on? Was there like a sale in the store? You bought out the store? He's, yeah, there was. He said, so why do you need 50 sets of dishes? He goes, oh, it's not for me, but sometimes people become religious, and then they, have, they, need, they want to keep kosher, and they need dishes, and they can't afford it. So now there's a sale. I've got to buy them dishes. So I have dishes to give everyone. This idea of thinking of other people, the other people is in his mind. I'll save you the few last stories. For the, the last stories are the best. You all know Rabbi Becher? Rabbi Mordechai Becher is a great speaker. So Rabbi Becher came to visit Gavriel in South Africa. So Gavriel says, why don't we go to Kruger National Park? You're speaking in the evening, we'll have a good time together. So they're walking in the National Park together, taking a stroll, and they see from a distance two guys sitting on a rock. And those two people looked like Afrikaners. Now, I don't know if you know what Afrikaners are in South Africa. They're the people who kept apartheid going. They hate blacks. They hate Jews. They hate everyone but themselves. They're supremacists. You know, they're blonde and blue. They're like themselves. They hate us. And you don't want to start up with an Afrikaner because they're pretty mean as well. So God turns to Rabbi Becher and says, let's go over to them. Maybe, maybe one of them is Jewish. So Rabbi Becher says, no, the Afrikaners, can't you see? Let's not go over because i got to give a speech tonight. <laughs> and I think I won't, you know. So God says, no, I think we got to go over. You never know. Life is like that. It's very, let's go over. So he walks over to these two guys and he says, hello, every, uh, hi, how you doing? Hello. And they look up at him with sort of a mean, annoyed face. And he says to them, well, my name is Rabbi Klatz. Goes, anyone here Jewish? Either you Jewish? So... They both look up at him, first like he's nuts. And then one of them says, actually, I'm Jewish. So Rabbi Becher was stunned. Why? You, you, they look like Afrikaans. One of them was Jewish. So God says, oh, there we go. Can I ask you something? Sure. Do you do anything Jewish? No. Synagogue? No. Kosher? No. Shabbos? No. Yom Kippur? No. Hanukkah? No. Pesach? No. God says, I never met a Jew who didn't do anything Jewish. How could that be? You don't do anything. Thank you. So the guy says, okay, I do one thing Jewish. Great, what do you do? God was trying to encourage him. What do you do? He says, you know, my, my mom is Jewish. My dad's not. I didn't grow up Jewish. But I know that I'm considered Jewish. So about a half a year ago, I, be, I was a little bit interested in my Judaism. You know, what does it mean? I don't know, even know what it means. So I went online, I began to Google Jew, Judaism, Hebrew, whatever, and I found this website, so Ask the Rabbi website, and I've been dialoguing with this rabbi just to ask him questions about Judaism. So Rabbi Becker walks around, Gavriel, and says, pardon me, what's the name of that website again? So he tells him the name. He says, are you Michael? Are you Mordecai? <laughs> <laughs> they had been dialoguing with each other for a half a year and they met randomly in Kruger National Park because got real and that story actually was published in a book called Small Miracles and that's with Gav here's another story uh, Gav is walking he's walking in the mall and this person's walking with him and said Rav Gav how is it that everyone connects with you like Jewish people they they just like stick to you. What is it about you? Because it's not, nothing to do with me. Jews love each other. They just want to connect. Right? That's, that, that, that's what they're all about. He said, watch. And they're walking in the mall, and he walks into the musical instrument store. And he says to the fellow, do you mind if I use your drums? The guy says, can you play? He says, I could play pretty good. He was a great drummer. So he sat down and first began to play simple beat, and then it gets more complicated. Finally, he's like, he's, there's a virtuoso performance going on. And people, as they're walking in the, in the mall, they hear the drums, they think to themselves, hey, free concert, let's check it out. And they walk in, and they see Gavriel playing on the drums like crazy, and just stand and watch. And more and more and more people are filing in to watch this performance. Soon, the whole store was full, which I'm sure made the musical instrument guy really happy. 
Gabriel pretends he doesn't notice, he's drumming, drumming, finally ends with a big crash on the cymbals, and everyone claps wildly for Rav Gav. He stands up, and he says to them, hi everyone, everyone says, hi, he says, my name is Rav Gav, is anyone here Jewish? And about 15 people raised their hand. This is Johannesburg. There's a lot of Jews there. About 15 people raised their hand. He says, great. You have each just won a free Shabbat meal. And he had these free Shabbat meal cards he used to carry with him. <laughs> and he took out the cards. And you've won a free Shabbat meal. And he took their names and numbers and invited them for Shabbat. That's how he connected them. The last two stories. He was once walking. He was once walking in Johannesburg with a student. And the student, and they walked right near an Afrikaner biker bar. Now, if, you, if an Afrikaner in Kruger National Park is dangerous, could you imagine one in a biker bar, drunk on a bike, you know, and, you know with, with uh, all of his friends around him? Scary. So the Gavs, it was a student, says to him for a joke, he says, Rabbi, maybe we should go in there because maybe there are some Jews in there. So Gavs, okay, let's go. So he's, no, Rabbi, I'm just kidding. You're not going to walk into an Afrikaner biker bar. You know, got the arm, got a little beard. You're not going to walk. You know, it's a suicide. God says, no, it's okay. We're going to walk in and you never know. So he walks in and he knocks on the first table. Pardon me, is anyone here Jewish? And he's got this group of guys sitting there. You have to picture. they got goatees. They've got spikes coming out of all their orifices. <laughs> They've got... No sleeves, but they got mom with a skull and crossbones tattooed on their biceps. And each one of them alone could rip Gavriel and his friends simultaneously to shreds. <laughs> so God says, anyone here Jewish? And they look up at him, and they're not sure. Mm, that's never happened. What do we do with a guy like this? So they said, no. Go, oh, no worry, mates. Keep on drinking. Enjoy yourselves. Go to the next table. Pardon me, is anyone here Jewish? Pardon me, is anyone... And from table to table he goes, asking if anyone's Jewish. The bar is very quiet. People are looking at this bizarre scene of a rabbi coming and asking, is anyone Jewish? Finally, they figure he must be insane, certifiably so. So they're going to leave him be. He gets to the last table. Pardon me, is anyone here Jewish? This one really, really tough looking guy turns around and says, who wants to know? <laughs> he says, well, I do. I'm a, I'm a rabbi and I like to meet Jewish people. So he said, I'm Jewish, and he pulls out a necklace with a mug and dove it, and everyone at this table here is Jewish. He said, you're all Jew? What are you doing in an Afrikaner biker bar? He says, because no one tells a Jew where we could drink and where we can't drink. They're looking for a fight. They look just like everyone else, but they're looking for a fight. So God said, well, guess what, guys? I'm so glad I met you, because there's a Johnny Walker party at my house tomorrow. Free booze. Who's coming? <laughs> So they look at him and says, Rabbi, it's free. He says, totally free, 8 o'clock. And he gives them his address. They said, we're going to be there, Rabbi. The booze is free, right? We'll be there. <laughs> so God's 100%. So the next day he goes and makes sure he's got enough Johnny Walker to feed a hungry mob. And he brings it to his house. 8 o'clock that evening. A train, a thunderous noise of motorcycles comes pulling up his quiet little street in Glen Hazel in Johannesburg. And they all park next to each other, their motorcycles next to each other in front of his yard. And all the neighbors are looking you know, from behind the curtains. What's going on in the rabbi's house? This is weird happening. The rabbi, all these bikes. And they all come walking like a bunch of gorillas. And God says, come on in, come on in. And he quickly put a table right by the door. And he says, come on in, because all your weapons put on the table, and then come right in. <laughs> so, so they weren't that happy about it, but they complied, and out came an arsenal. Guns and knives and nunchucks and switchblades and brass knuckles, an entire arsenal of, of weapons, and it's all piled high on the table. Okay, guys, come on in. And he pours them all some Johnny Walker. He says, fellas, you know what Lachayim is, right? Yeah, we're Jewish, Rabbi. Great, everyone, Lachayim! And they all make a Lachayim, and he drinks, and he begins to schmooze with them. For about an hour, he's just schmoozing and really connecting with them. And after about an hour, he reaches back, and he takes a Chumash, and he opens up and says, Fellas, I can't help myself. I'm a rabbi. Can I share with you a beautiful idea? Would that be okay? And they said, Sure, Rabbi, go for it. 
And thus began the Jewish biker gang Sheer of Johannesburg that met weekly to learn by their beloved Rabbi Rav Gav. Each week they would come, their parents had rejected them, their peers, their teachers, they were the dregs of society, but they found somebody who would love them and who would believe in them. A few years after he passed away, someone sent me a tape of an interview that was done in Arut Sheva in Israel, a fellow named Abi. Um, was, was on the radio being interviewed and he was an artist in Israel and he was studying in yeshiva and he was one of the original biker, bi biker gang members who's today he was learning in yeshiva he was a from Ben Torah and everything because somebody believed in him the last story now when somebody passes away and I hope that for each of you this is not for many many years to come but when somebody passes away and you've never experienced it before, you're not sure how you're going to react. I was warned that there are two times that are the most difficult emotionally for people who are in Shiva. And one is the actual funeral, when you're standing there in front of the body and you didn't get a chance to say goodbye and it's very painful and you don't know what to do, they're, they're there but they're not there. But then comes the Shiva, and the Shiva actually protects you. It's like a cocoon. People are coming and they're, they're serving you food and they're asking you how you're doing and you don't go to work. And really it's, it's a chesed that, I, that Hashem gave us, this halacha called shiva. But after shiva, there is a custom. And the custom is to walk around the block to signify the end of shiva. That had never happened to me and I did not know what to expect. But I was warned that the walk around the block is the second most painful time when, you have, when you're in Avelos after the, actual, after the actual funeral. And I want to describe to you my walk around the block that signified the end of our Shiva. It was the seventh day, you don't mourn the entire seven days. The last day you only mourn Miktas Hayom, a little bit of the day. So you have breakfast, you dive and you have breakfast. And then my father says, okay, it's time to begin our walk around the block. And we were mourning in Yerushalayim and Harnov, and we got up, walked outside, it was a very hot Yerushalayim morning, it's already hot, we look around, no one was in the streets, parents were at work, kids were in school, empty, streets were empty, and we begin to walk, me, my brothers, my father, the community walks behind you to give you your space, and no one's talking, it's all silent. And as we're walking, and you get so quiet, you can hear your footsteps on the pavement, which really makes the whole thing very morbid and sad. And the whole time I'm thinking, I'm not ready for Shiva to end. I'm not ready to stop speaking about Gav. I'm not ready to, you know, close the book on his life. Who he was, what he was, I didn't get a chance to say goodbye. And the whole walk was so painful. I turned to see how my father's holding up. My father's an emergency room doctor. He's a dignified person. I figured he probably is, is okay. You know, he's probably strong. I look at him. He was not strong. He was weeping away. My mother told me afterwards that the first year of, of Avelis, she would wake up constantly in the middle of the night and find my father sitting at the foot of the bed with his face in his hands weeping. And it's very, very tough. A person never gets over the death of a child. My parents were never the same. So... I look at him and he's falling apart and so are my brothers and I keep on thinking, you know, we were supposed to grow old together. We were the three musketeers. We were, you know, we, I was in the, uh, Rabbanas, Kiruv, Kiruv. We, you know, we were going to grow old and walk down the chuppahs together. And just the whole thing was, was surreal and it was sad. And I can't, it's hard to describe but it almost felt like we were walking down to a very dark place. And by the time I finished my walk around the block, I really felt a great sense of helplessness and hopelessness. And to make it even worse, as I'm about to walk back in the house, my mother and the widow are just walking out of the house to begin their walk around the block. They, should have, they could have walked with us, but my mother was so frail she was going to collapse, so people from the community had to hold her up. And I look at my mother who just lost a child, and I look at the widow. You have to understand, the widow Yocheved was 26 years old. She was married to a prince of a husband, and she now has to bring up four children. 
on her own. And most of them are never going to remember their father. And it was so, so painful to see it that by the time I walked in the house, I, I was falling apart. And I didn't want anyone to say anything. Don't say it'll be okay, it'll get better. Just don't say anything. It was, it was such a difficult moment. And as we walk into the living room, we see that there is a fellow who's sitting on a chair. And I want to describe to you, he's a very princely face. I never met him before. And he was wearing a beautiful kind of colorful jacket, like a very malchustic. And as we walk in the room, he looks at us and he begins to sing. And I want you to feel the moments. I'm going to sing to you exactly how it was when we came in. We come in the room, he looks at us, and he begins to sing. Nachamu, Nachamu, Ami, Yomar Elokechem. Be comforted, be comforted, my people. Be comforted, my nation. So says Hashem. So says your God. And I look at him and it's surreal. And I knew what to do. I took a chair and so did my brothers. And we sat down next to him. And we began to sing and we're swaying back and forth. Nachamu, Nachamu, be comforted. Try to find comfort. Life has to go on. And we get up to the high part. High part is... Dabru alei virushalayim fikiru eileha Dabru alei virushalayim fikiru eileha And we're sitting and singing and, 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 and it's a tefillah, it's a tefillah. And when we finished, I get up and I go over to this fellow and I gave him a hug and a kiss. And I said, who are you and how did you know to do that? Of all things that anyone could have done when we walked in the room, nothing would have been right. Really nothing except what you just did. I feel that you really, really were Mekayim. You gave us a Nechama and I feel like, like we can move on now. Who are you? So he told us his name, and he said, I want to tell you, I was one of your brother's best friends. I loved him like my own brother. I, 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 I'm in such agony that he passed away. And he says, I want to tell you that a year ago, I got married to the most beautiful, wonderful girl. You know, you wait all your life, he tells me, to find that one person you're zivug nachon, you're in vehagefen, bin vehagefen. You'll wait to find that person and you hope Hashem delivers that person to you. Well, guess what? I did. So, so, so happy. Madly in love. We got married underneath the, Yer the Yerushalayim sky, underneath the Yerushalayim stars. It's the most amazing, amazing chuppah. And then we moved, to, we moved to an apartment in Yerushalayim. We were married for one month. And I come home from Kolel one day and I find that my wife is sprawled out, unconscious on the kitchen floor. I call the paramedics, Malgin David Adom. They came, they took my wife away, and she never woke up. And a few days later, my kala of one month was taken from me. And I, I really felt like my life was over. He says, my shiva, my, the levaya, a blur, I don't remember it. It was muffled, it was, I was numb. And people were trying to give me comfort, no, nothing worked. I remember my walk around the block. I remember my footsteps as they went against the Yerushalayim pavement. And I remember how painful it was. And I remember when I finished my walk, how lost and alone I felt. And at my lowest point, right when I entered the door there was Rav Gav sitting on a chair singing Nachamu Nachamu for me this this same song that we're singing for him now he sung this for me and just like you I pulled up a chair And I sang Nachamu Nachamu with him. And we finished, he came over and he gave me a hug and a kiss. And he said, I want to tell you, even though it seems like your life is over, it's not. You're going to find happiness in your life, I promise you that. 
you'll never forget this beautiful woman that you were zeichet to call your wife for one month here on earth. But you will find happiness and you will get remarried. And not only that, I know what I'm buying you for your wedding present because you're going to get remarried. I'm going to buy you a tishbakasha. I'm going to buy you this beautiful jacket to wear at the Shabbos table. And it kept me going. And here I am sitting and singing Nachmu Nachmu for Rav Gav himself, wearing the jacket that he bought me just a week ago after I got married to my beautiful new kala under the Yishalayim stars. And I started off this talk asking, are you a giver or a taker? And we're very quick to say we're givers. It's easy to say, yeah, I'm a giver. I, I give. I help for Shabbos. I, I do this. I do that. But there's so much more we could do. There really is so much more. And I think that we have chiv to do so much more. And we have to realize that Hashem has such high hopes for us. And we never know when it's the end. God wrote this beautiful poem. I wish I knew it by heart. You can find it online. You can also find the video of him online. It's on YouTube. Just look up the incredible Rav Gav. You could see pictures of him and you could hear him speak. He's a very, very warm person. And he wrote this, he wrote in the poem, he wrote, time starts to run out. Do we start thinking what life is about? He wasn't sick when he wrote it. He was just always thinking like that. Or will we go on the same as before? Will we grow and strive for more? And then he writes, let's not wait for our time to run out. Let's start thinking what life is about. Let us grow, let us strive, let us learn how to live. And greatest of all, let us learn how to give. These are the words of Rav Gav. He wrote it to himself to remind himself what life is about. So my bracha to you is that each and every person should find a way in their heart and in their life to become the best givers that Hashem knows and that you know you could become. Thank you very much.